Welcome back to the Homesteads and Homeschools podcast. Today is episode number 21, which means... That's right. The state has deemed us old enough to consume fermented beverages. And what better way to celebrate episode 21 and fermented beverages than by talking to the fermentation guru himself, Mr. Sander Katz. It also means, of course, that you can find the show notes at homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 021. Couldn't let that slip past. Uh, I talked to Sander Cass today about um, food preservation. You know, we as as homesteaders, someone with a, a garden that wants to preserve some of their their bounty, uh, fermenting is a great way to do it. It really kind of you know it adds to some of the, the health benefits of, of your food. Um, you know, it doesn't last as long as maybe say uh, heat canning. Uh, you know, but um, it's tasty, it's a unique flavor, and it's and it's good for you, and, and you can't complain about that. This is actually sort of the second interview I did with Sander. Um, the first one, my computer froze halfway through and uh, eh, called it a day from there. So I actually have that interview, and it is different. Uh, as you can imagine, I don't go, I don't, I don't have a script for these interviews. They're just kind of uh, random questions and, and the like. This, uh, the first 30 minutes of the interview are available on the Patreon for, I think, $250 a month. You can, uh, you can get access to things like this. Um, this extra half hour interview with Sander Katz talking about fermentation. Um, you know, extra bonus interview I did with, uh, David the Good. And, and I think I may, may put together some, uh, some of my more amusing errors that I have, uh, produced. Of course, not for public consumption because, well, that would be silly, but, uh, they're there. It'll, it, it exists somewhere forever and ever. Of course the, the NSA no doubt has it. Um, but, uh, I ramble, I ramble and, uh, I ramble because the, the interview is longer and I won't ramble at the end. So I, I ramble now, but yeah, go check it out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Liberty Hippie. Find us on Facebook, um, facebook.com slash homesteads and homeschools. Send me an email, homesteads and homeschools at gmail.com, Twitter, H S and H S pod. And, uh, yeah, you know, give me give me your thoughts. I appreciate the feedback. I, I really truly do. Positive or negative, it, it makes no difference. Feedback is uh, is good feedback. And uh, one more final announcement. Um, I actually uh, spoke with Lloyd Cowan um, from uh, the episode two two weeks ago. Um, the the urban homesteaders nightmare. He sent me a message. The uh, the town of Madison upheld its ban on backyard farms at last night's town meeting. We tried to get additional amendments, but the selectmen would not hear from us. So a violation is given 30-day compliance, then $200 a day fine after that. So you can imagine um, things did not go well. So a uh, uh, backyard farmer's last resort now is to file for a variance. Um, and of course, if you decide to file for a variance, that cost is on you. And you are filing a variance with the very same people that uh, passed this amendment, that passed this ordinance in the first place. So, um, good luck with that. Anyway, it's it's uh it's tough, you know, it's tough. Um, so, pay attention to uh, to your to what's going on around you. Pay attention to your to your local government. Um, you never know when when people try to sneak things in. It's it's disturbing when they do. So, ah, that's all for now. Um, I'm gonna get into the show and uh we'll we'll wrap it up real quick at the end and uh have you have you on your way so without further ado let's go sow those liberty seeds with mr sander Katz. i was once out strolling one very hot summer's day and I thought I'd lay myself down to rest In a big field of tall grass I lay there in the sun And felt it caressing my face as I So uh, my guest today is Mr. Sander Katz. Uh, he's the author of Wild Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, and The Art of Fermentation. 
Um, Sanders has been fermenting things for, I don't know, two decades now at least, I think. Um, travels the world uh, giving lectures and, and leading fermentation workshops, um, including a, a spring residency program in mid-April and uh, a fall program that uh, I believe is the end of October. So welcome to the show, Sander. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you are a, uh, a big fermentation guy, right? I mean, that's kind of your, your thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of fermenting. Yeah, it's true. All right. So um, I guess kind of to start, what, is, what are some of the differences, or, I think, when, when we hear pickle, right? When, when people think about pickles, um, I think one of the images that kind of we, we conjure up is this, uh, the aisle in the grocery store of uh, a bunch of hot packed, uh, maybe crunchy, maybe mushy, uh, pickles, peppers, relishes. Is, is that what we're talking about? When you, when you say pickles, what is it that, that you mean? What do you, well, I would say that a, a pickle certainly encompasses that. Um, I, I mean, I would define a pickle as anything that's preserved in an acidic medium. So the pickles of, of my youth growing up in New York city, um, as the grandson of immigrants from Eastern Europe, were fermented pickles. And so like, I loved pickles as a kid. And my idea of a pickle was, you know, this flavor that I now know is the flavor of lactic acid fermentation. And so there's no vinegar added to those pickles. Typically, it would just be cucumbers, salt, garlic, dill, grape leaves to help keep it crunchy. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and then, and then that's it. Um, I mean, basically, what what supermarket shoppers uh, uh, are buying is is definitely also a pickle. If you pour a hot vinegar solution over bulls, eggs, or pigs' feet, or or anything <laughs> that preserves them, then then that too is a pickle. But um, you know, if we think about sort of vinegar being something that's produced from alcohol, being something that's produced from sugars. I mean, in most parts of the world, that was more precious than salt. So, I mean, most um, like outside of the major traditional uh, uh, wine production regions of the world, um, most pickles, um, um, you know, for for hundreds of years, probably longer than that, have been made through a lactic acid fermentation process, and it's really only. Um, since um, the advent of distilled white vinegar, the vinegar that's cheaper than water in the supermarket, um, you know, as well as the phenomenon of the supermarket itself and needing these shelf-stable products, um, that, that, that vinegar pickling really became the, the, the um, you know, more widespread form of pickling. But they're, they're both pickles. I mean, pickles, right. I mean, sour, sauerkraut is a pickle too. I mean, anything preserved in an acidic medium is definitely a, a, a pickle. And there's a number of different ways to achieve that. And, you know, each way is, ha, has its pros and cons. I mean, vinegar pickles are great because you can create a shelf-stable product that can sit there for, um, for years. Right. But then there, there are trade-offs. Just the fact of it having been heat processed diminishes the vitamin C in the vegetables, which is usually the nutritional point of preserving vegetables is to preserve vitamin C. Um, and, you know, from my standpoint, as someone who grew up with lactic acid sour pickles, um, you know, the flavor of lactic acid pickles is just far superior to me, to my palate, than, um, than, than the vinegar pickles. But of course, you know, that, that's completely subjective and, you know, generally formed by people's experiences. So I certainly have met lots of people who feel like you know, that's what defines a pickle for them is a, is a, is a, is a vinegar pickle. Okay. So, all right, that's, uh, you know, we can heat, heat process them. And then you're talking a little bit in there about the, uh, the lacto, I guess, lacto fermented kind, the more, um, natural fermentation as well. Is that, with your yeah, vinegar sure. baths. I mean, the, sp the spontaneous fermentation of vegetables will always result in lactic acid developing. I mean, basically, it's, it, I mean, calling lactic acid bacteria lactic acid bacteria is almost a misnomer because it makes people imagine that it comes from milk. Um, 
And while it's true that, you know, all lactating animals have lactic bacteria, uh, like on their nipples. So, mm -hmm. so the, the, the milk gets populated by lactic acid bacteria. Um, also all plants growing out of soil on planet earth are host to lactic bacteria. So it's just, you know, they're, they're on the, um, you know, nipples of, um, you know, lactating mammals, you know, because they're on the plants that we're touching all the time and that we're eating all the time. Um, and so, um, you know, when you shred cabbage and salt it, um, um, lactic acid bacteria are what um, uh, develop spontaneously. And if you do a slightly different process for making pickles, let's say you take whole cucumbers, you, you put a lot of garlic, some dill, some grape leaves. And then because it's impossible to pull the water out of the whole cucumbers, then you pour a, um, a, a salt solution, a brine over that. Um, and then what develops is lactic acid bacteria that are present already on the cucumbers, or you can also do the same thing with okra or string beans or green tomatoes or any one of a number of vegetables. Right. Just, just about anything almost. Um, all right. And, uh, so I guess if you go back then when, so you say you grew up in the city and, uh, you remember pickles, how did you go from pickles in New York city to, uh, doing all that you do fermenting like everything well i mean first of all i should say that i never was making pickles in new york city like uh, you know they, they were they were abundantly available to me like as a kid when i ha started having a little bit of independence and a little bit of pocket change like pickles were a snack that i would seek out for myself um i loved pickles um i had a reputation in my family for that but i never <laughs> i never made them and my motivation to learn how to make pickles, how to make sauerkraut, how to begin fermenting all kinds of things, uh, uh, came from um, a move that I made uh, 26 uh, years ago from my hometown of New York City to this community in rural Tennessee. Um, uh, and I lived down the road from the community, but I lived in the community for many years. And, you know, one of the... Uh, one of my motivations for moving, um, you know, was a desire to get involved in gardening. I had gotten really okay. interested in, in, in food. I'd gotten really interested in vegetables. Um, I'd really, I'd gotten really interested in herbal medicine and I just had, um, you know, I had this feeling that I wanted to get closer to plants. I wanted to have the experience of growing plants and just, um, um, you know, getting more focused on plants and, um, and uh, so, you know, that was part of the motivation for this move that I made. And so the first year that I was uh, gardening, which was 1993, I mean, I was such a naive city kid that <laughs> it had never occurred to me that in a garden, all the cabbage would be ready at about the same time, or all the radishes would be ready at around the same time, or all the cucumbers would be ready at around the same time. So, um, you know, the first year of gardening, when, when suddenly we had a bunch of cabbage that was ready to eat, um, I decided to learn how to make sauerkraut. I, I already knew that I liked sauerkraut. Um, I knew that sauerkraut was regarded as a way to preserve cabbage. And, um, you know, I literally looked in the joy of cooking and I found a, a recipe for how to make sauerkraut. I was like, oh, okay, this, this seems pretty simple and straightforward. And, um, and, and honestly, that, that first kraut that I made was, made was like so easy. It was so delicious. It was so satisfying um, that it just, you know, it, that got me wanting to investigate how to ferment other things. I learned how to make pickles out of cucumbers, you know, the kind that I had loved eating in New York. I learned how to make um, uh, country wines. The first one was out of elderberries. Uh, I learned how to make yogurt. We had, a, we had a herd of goats and sometimes had more milk that we knew how to do with. I started or knew what to do with. Sometimes I, would, I, learned, how, I learned how to make cheese. I started a sourdough starter and learned how to bake with a sourdough. And, um, you know, so I just got, I just got, you know, yeah. interested in fermentation and then that, that, you know, transformed itself Thrown into, into a it. full on obsession with all things yeah. fermented. And I started like, you know, going to the university library and looking in the home economics section and finding, you know, cookbooks from different kinds of cultural traditions and trying to find what kinds of, you know, ferments there, there were from those parts of the world and, you know, figure out how to make them. So, um, you know, I became just kind of obsessed with all things ferment. Good. Yeah. How did you, how did you figure it all out in the beginning? Like when you, when you moved from the city down into, uh, to, to Tennessee there, 
how did you did you do a bunch of reading like how did you learn the the gardening aspect of things the the planting aspect the uh you know how to raise goats and stuff like that did you was that something you learned from the people you were living with is that something you read well, up on i mean was i was it- I mean, combination. I mean, I, so I moved to this community where these things were already happening. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, I was like, I want to raise goats. Let's go out and buy some, some goats. You know, I mean, people around me were milking goats. And at some point I like, you know, just milked with a couple of other people and learned how to milk and started milking gardening. Same thing. You know, I mean, yeah, my, my, my dad had done, had, had done some gardening, so it wasn't completely unfamiliar with it, but, Mm -hmm. um, but, but I also wasn't, um, uh, I I was never really very, very directly involved. Um, uh, but I had watched him. So between, you know, what I had seen my dad doing and what people in the community who were, were already involved in gardening were doing. And then I also like to do my own independent research. So I was reading some books about gardening. Um, so yeah, I mean, all, all, all of the above, but I'd say mostly I was guided by the people who I was living with, who were more experienced in the garden. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. Cause you can, you can read up on all that stuff, but when you have someone to kind of guide you through, it, it makes a lot of these processes so much, so much simpler when we can use each other's but, knowledge. But interestingly with, I mean, with fermentation, I really did not have a, a central mentoring figure and, um, you know, I really did primarily learn from books how to how to ferment things. Right. I mean, I don't know much about uh, fermentation beyond uh, what you've done in, in the sense of uh, who's been out there fermenting things. But I imagine when you were figuring it all out, um, there probably weren't a whole lot of people that were fermenting stuff that were doing kind of what you were doing, looking looking at different cultures um, and seeing what, what they were doing. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I mean, there might not have been a lot of people doing what I was doing, but I mean, fermentation itself is so um, uh, integral to, you know, all kinds of food traditions. Yeah. I mean, like whenever I would meet old timers who grew up in Tennessee on a farm, you know, I mean, sour. Yeah. Kraut would always um, uh, uh, spot a uh, wrecking for them because, you know, if you're going to live in a temperate climate like this and live primarily off of the land, then, you know, you have to preserve some of the vegetables from the fall to get you through the winter. And so, you know, all, all the agrarian settler families around here were, were, were making sauerkraut. And when I started getting interested in this, I was still meeting old timers who just that was just part of their annual routine was was making making sauerkraut and you know i would say um you know this wasn't completely evident to me when i was first learning about it but when i first started teaching and and promoting my book and traveling to uh, traveling around and talking to large numbers of people about fermentation i mean i just started learning how yeah, important fermentation is culturally all, all around the world. And so, you know, I was always meeting immigrants who had come to this country and may, maybe some favorite fermented foods from where they came from were not available here. So they were trying to like get a handle on fermentation so they could try to, you know, replicate mm-hmm. those foods for themselves here. Um you know, there's, there's, you know, just so many reasons why, why people are interested in fermentation. I mean, all the most compelling flavors of the world, uh, uh, derive from, from fermentation. So, you know, it's flavors, it's, uh, you know, how it transforms foods nutritionally and, and people who are interested in, um, you know, nutrition and health and, mm-hmm. and probiotics are all interested in it. So, I mean, there's just, there's so many reasons to be interested in fermentation. Yeah, there, it really is. And it's, I think that's what's fun about reading um, some of your your books there that it's not just they're not just recipes. There's like a little bit of the the history behind it that, um, you know, you have more of an idea when you can, you know, get it, get an idea of the the culture it's coming from and where it's coming from and and the why is behind it. It makes it um, I don't know more more accessible, I think. But uh, so going back to the uh, the nutritional value. You say that it uh, it uh, I don't know increases value or it changes some of the what's what's available um, nutritionally. Is it? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I mean, I mean, there's a number of. First of all, I should say that you know, fermented foods and beverages are so varied that it's difficult to generalize. Right. It's not as if coffee and salami and bread and sauerkraut and cheese um, uh, all have the same nutritional qualities. 
Um, but you know, if we look at it, we can see some very clear patterns um, uh, uh, in the ways in which fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. And I would say that there are uh, four broad ways in which foods are transformed nutritionally. The first I would call pre-digestion. This is the idea that you know while the you know while the fermentation is happening, really what's happening are is that bacteria and or fungi are digesting nutrients in the food. So they're absorbing some of them, but then they're also breaking them down. And they're, they're, they're always byproducts of fermentation. So the most famous byproduct of fermentation would be alcohol. Alcohol is a byproduct of fermentation. So, you know, uh, yeast are consuming sugars and producing alcohol and carbon dioxide out of them. Um, um, in a fermentation of soybeans, you take that, you know, that soy protein, which, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, soybeans are considered to be the plant food with the most uh, concentrated protein. But the problem with it is that our human digestive systems can't extract the protein from a soybean, which is why you really never hear about people soaking soybeans, cooking them until they're soft, and then eating mm -hmm. soybeans for dinner the way they might with pinto beans or lentils or, or lots of other kinds of beans because the protein in soybeans is just in, indigestible. So, I mean, the, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture thousands of years ago recognized this and figured out all of these ways to ferment the soybeans, which effectively breaks down the proteins into amino acids, which our bodies, uh, which, which are much more accessible to us and incidentally create just much more um, uh, 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 powerful flavors. So, um, you know, when you, when you break down um, um, proteins into amino acids, it, it creates what, what, what's called umami flavors um, that people find extremely uh, 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 satisfying. Yep. Um, so, um, so nutrients become more bioavailable. I mean, uh, 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 minerals in grains and beans and nuts and any kind of seed food are, are generally tied up in these chemical bonds called phytate bonds that our body cannot directly break down. So minerals become more bioavailable in these seed foods as a result of this pre-digestion power of fermentation. Lactose, the sugar in milk that so many people have a hard time uh, uh, digesting, is broken down by fermentation. So many people who can't drink milk have a fine time eating yogurt. Um, even gluten, the, the, the wheat protein that so many people have a hard time with, can be broken down by fermentation, not by yeast, but by bacteria. So if you're if you're having a like fast uh, a fast fermented bread made from a packet of yeast, you're not going to get that pre digestion. But if you do what's called a sourdough and use natural leavening, which involves a community of organisms, uh, uh, yeast along with lactic bacteria and other bacteria, the bacteria actually break down uh, 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 some of the gluten, so you have lower gluten levels. So so pre digestion really describes a wide range of distinct processes, but where they have in common is that you know the organisms of fermentation are breaking down nutrients into sim simpler more elemental generally more accessible forms then the flip side of pre-digestion is detoxification and this is the same thing except instead of breaking down nutritive compounds it's breaking down toxic compounds so whether it's cyanide in cassava or um, oxalic mm -hmm. acid in rhubarb or other vegetables. Um, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a wide range of potentially toxic compounds in foods that can be broken down uh, uh, by fermentation. Then beyond breaking down what's in the food you begin with, fermentation generates additional nutrients. Uh, almost every fermented food or beverage has elevated levels of B vitamins as a result of the fermentation. It's really from an accumulation of microbial bodies, whether they're still alive in a, in a live culture ferment or whether they've been uh, killed off by, by heat or alcohol or acidity. Um, um, you know, it still represents an increase in B vitamins. Certain ferments have uh, elevated levels of K vitamins. And then there are these, I, I would call them, um, like micronutrients that are fermentation byproducts, some of which we've been finding have specific therapeutic value. Um, you know, so for instance, you know, um, uh, uh, fermented vegetables 
have these compounds called isothiocyanates that are considered anti-carcinogenic. Uh, natto, this Japanese soybean ferment, has a compound called natto kinase. Natto has never become very popular in the West, but every vitamin supplement store in North America has natto kinase because <laughs> it's a blood thinner and it also um, dissolves fibrin, which is the fibers that sometimes build up inside people's blood vessels that can constrict circulation. So people with circulatory and heart problems are often taking this natto kinase, which is a byproduct of um, uh, 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 natto fermentation. But, but finally, what I would consider to be the most profound benefit of fermented foods would be the living bacteria themselves. And um, you know, contrary to the indoctrination that most of us have received throughout our lives, the bacteria are so dangerous and um, cause disease and need to be avoided and when encountered need to be killed by any means necessary. <laughs> it turns out that, you know, bacteria are really the matrix of all life on planet Earth. Um, where we, I mean, there's a broad consensus in the field of evolutionary biology that, you know, all other life is descended from bacteria. The, the corollary to this is no other form of life has ever lived without bacteria. And indeed, a healthy human body in our intestines, mm -hmm. we, we have more than one trillion bacteria. That's, you know, many times more bacteria than we have bodily cells. And these bacteria, you know, actually provide us with essential services. They enable us to effectively digest food and extract nutrients from our food. What we call our immune system is largely the work of, of these uh, bacteria. And increasingly in recent years, we're finding that they're involved in all kinds of regulatory systems within our bodies, including our brain chemistry, you know, serotonin and other compounds that determine how we think and how we feel are regulated in ways that are not fully understood by bacteria in our intestines. And, you know, our, our, our liver health, our uh, circulatory health, I mean, virtually every aspect of our functionality uh, is turning out to relate to these bacteria in our intestines, which because of antibiotic drugs and um, antibacterial cleansing products and chlorine in our drinking water and just eating more processed foods and less fibers. Um, you know, we, we basically all, at least everybody, um, you know, in, um, you know, industrial or post-industrial societies, you know, we're, 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 we're facing diminished biodiversity in our guts and that, um, you know, is is potentially part of many of the emerging health epidemics. Um, and so, you know, we have this word probiotics, which means, you know, people trying to, um, you know, introduce bacteria that will be beneficial. And people do this with capsules, but people do this also with live fermented foods where the bacteria are still intact. And, you know, I would say that the great advantage of the uh, traditional foods as compared to the probiotic capsules is is their biodiversity, and I really think that the you know the point of probiotics is uh, biodiversity. Now, of course, along with probiotics, we have to think about what's called prebiotics, which is you know eating the kinds of nutrients that will uh, feed the bacteria all along the uh, uh, intestinal tract. So that means more high fiber foods. Um, that means more foods with. Um, complex carbohydrates and um, uh, polysaccharides that, um, uh, 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 that are not so easily digested so that they really are feeding bacteria along the entire length of the intestines. All right. So we, we, gotta, we should be introducing more bacteria into our, into our systems, right? Into our life and feeding it. Yeah, yeah, no, I would, yeah, I would, I would, I would say so. But I mean, I think people also, you know, if people have that as an objective, Either they need to make stuff themselves or they have to be very savvy com consumers because, yeah. you know, not all sauerkraut is the same. Not all yogurt is the same. So, um, um, you know, you really need uh, uh, products that have not been heat processed after their fermentation. Um, so that means you can't buy sauerkraut in a can. Um, you know, you, you're basically going to need to buy sauerkraut that's like in a jar in a refrigerated section. Um, and, and generally they're going to boast on the packaging about their live cultures. Same thing with yogurt. There's a, um, you know, the, most yogurt has live cultures, but they always say it on the label. <laughs> um, so you just have to, you just have to read labels or get into making it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, 
I, I started to notice that a bit more. And I, I think it's because it's become more of a trend and maybe it's more because I'm paying attention, but I, I think I've seen that more of the, you know, the natural pickles, the naturally fermented pickles are in the, the pickle aisle. In the, in the refrigerated section, there's, there's actual pickles now and there's actual sauerkraut and there's actual kimchi and it's all labeled, you know, that, okay, this is live, live, uh, fermented yeah. stuff. There's probiotics in here, but, um, so what's, what's to stop me from, uh, from eating some bad, some bad bacteria in this mess? Well, I mean, for, well, first of all, I mean, personally, I don't think we know enough about bacteria to be labeling some of them good and some of them bad. But what I can tell you is that, um, uh, statistics, I, I, I mean, you know, the number of cases of food poisoning or illness or bacterial illness from fermented vegetables around the world, according to the USDA, zero. <laughs> like they cannot find one single documented case of food poisoning or illness from fermented vegetables. I mean, so here's the thing is what protects us from bacteria are bacteria. And, um, you know, every year we hear about people getting sick from raw vegetables, lettuce, tomatoes, spinach, you know, clearly there's the possibility of um, uh, contamination. Usually it's from a farm uphill, you know, manure from a farm uphill running over a field of vegetables. It could just as well be sloppy handling, somebody who fails to wash their hands at, you know, critical hygienic moments. Um but, um, you know, if you took those vegetables that could make somebody sick in a raw context and you ferment them, well, I mean, the lactic, the, the, the indigenous population of bacteria are always going to be able to overpower any incidental contaminating bacteria. And because um, with vegetables, the uh, indigenous bacteria, you know, under, under this um, uh, um, anaerobic uh, 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 environment when the vegetables are submerged because everything's different if the vegetables are exposed to air. But as long as the vegetables are submerged, what's always going to dominate every single time or what does dominate every single time are lactic acid bacteria. And as they acidify the environment, they would kill. If, you, if, if there were any cells of salmonella or E. coli or things that we associate with um, food poisoning, they would perish from the acidity very quickly quickly um, as they fermented. And so, you know, one of the things that's so um, like elegant about acidification as a strategy for food preservation is that it's inherently a strategy for food safety because none of the things that we can worry about can survive in a sufficiently acidic environment. Mm -hmm. um, so you just don't have to worry about it. And, and, and really like the you know, the protection that we have against, um, you know, bad bacteria that could make someone sick is, is the bacteria that are dominant in that environment and, and, the, and the environmental condition that they create. Right. But the same is true of our bodies, of our environments. I mean, the bacteria in us, the bacteria around us are our greatest protection. And the more we are, the more we are killing off the bacteria in us and around us, um, you know, the more we are creating vulnerability um, to bacterial illness. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to to look and, and to see that you know, kind of the the way that people have been doing things, preserving food, and and keeping up with that for centuries is one of the most healthy ways, you know, um, yeah. one of the safest ways go, go figure. Right. Anyway, a couple, a couple random questions before we, uh, switch gears here. Um, this is more, I guess, like a, a personal question from, from my, my end of things. I've, so some things you, you stir, right. When you stir your, uh, um, your ferments, you agitate it and you stir things up and that's supposed to be good. Right. Um, but then sometimes I think, I've read in places where you're supposed to let it sit and let the carbon dioxide and let the, 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 yeah, I guess carbon dioxide just build up and create, a, a almost like a plug to keep the oxygen and, and, uh, away from, from your ferment. Um, what? Yeah. Well, okay. So, so let me just say that like stir stirring would be an example um, of what I would generically describe as, um, uh, uh, an environmental manipulation, 
And so, you know, everything we could possibly eat is, um, you know, covered with many different kinds of microorganisms. And, um, you know, the big question in fermentation is which ones are going to grow? And so, you know, the way that we um, uh, uh, guide which of the multitude of organisms that are that are present, you know, on the cabbage, on the soybean, on the wheat, uh, on the grape, um, you know, the way we sort of guide which of those organisms uh, uh, can develop is through various environmental manipulations. And that could be temperature, it could be uh, humidity. In the case of fermenting vegetables, it's getting submerged under liquid. But stirring could be one of them. And whether that's um, um, breaking up the surface so that we don't get lots of um, uh, uh, mold growing there, whether that's um, aerating yeast so that they can propagate more, more quickly, whether that's um, you know, distributing the um, um, activity that's happening. Um, you know, it's just one of the ways that we can manipulate environments. And um, you know, uh, some things I would always stir. Like mm -hmm. if I'm trying to get, um, um, if I'm trying to make uh, blueberry wine and I have my blueberry sugar syrup solution uh, poured over my blueberries, I want to stir those as often as possible, like at least once a day, because if I, you don't stir them once a day, you'll, you'll start getting mold developing on the surface, so a very minimum once a day. But if you can do it four times a day, it'll just get active much more quickly than if you do it once a day. Um, so, so vigorous stirring is really an important part of that, um, uh, for a number of reasons, but I would say that the most important reason is it aerates it and, and, and yeast can propagate more rapidly with oxygen than without oxygen. There are very few ferments that you would hurt by stirring them. Um, kombucha generally likes to be still, yogurt generally will only set if it's still, um, but you know, sauerkraut. I, personally, I never stir it. Okay. Um, but I don't think that there's any problem with stirring it. I typically have never stirred my misos that I'm aging for years. But when I was visiting Japan, I visited um, uh, a home miso maker who um, uh, that was part of her pro her process with it was was uh, uh, stirring them every uh, uh, every month or so. So I mean, there's very few processes that I could think of that would be hurt by stirring. Um, I mean, you know, even if the stirring is unnecessary, I mean, if the idea is, you know, that, that your uh, uh, constant production of carbon dioxide is displacing oxygen and preventing things from turning into alcohol, I mean, stirring it isn't going to prevent that. I mean, it, it, right. it'll continue producing the carbon dioxide. But I would say, you know, in every case, the most important thing is to try to have a clear idea of what the environment you're trying to create is. And, and so, so sometimes aspects of it don't really matter. Like I would say a lot of people struggle over the idea, like, do I put a cap on the jar or do I have to leave it open for, for airflow? And, you know, very little um, or in very few cases do, do the essential organisms for fermentation come from the air. I mean, sure, there are yeasts and there are bacteria in the air, and they could potentially become the agents of fermentation, but in virtually every case, the organisms you need are, are on the food. Right. So let's say you're making mead. The yeast is already in the honey. It can't do anything until the honey is diluted, so you add water, and then stirring it will speed the, the propagation of the yeast, but the yeast is there. It's not primarily coming from the air. It's primarily coming from the raw honey. Um, when you're making sauerkraut, it's mostly coming from the vegetables. If you're right. starting a sourdough starter, it's coming from the flour. If you're using well water or spring water, it's coming from the water. But, um, you know, very little of it is coming from the air. So it really ends up, it doesn't matter much if you're sealing the jar or not. If you're sealing the jar and it's something that's going to be creating carbon dioxide, <laughs> then you have to think about releasing the pressure. So I do a lot of things where I just, um, um, you know, I'll leave it on my kitchen counter. And in the morning when I'm making my coffee, I'll go ahead and just loosen the top and release any pressure that's built up overnight. Or of course, people are making more and more clever um, uh, uh, gadgets like um, airlocks for mason jars yeah. so that the carbon dioxide can release itself, but it keeps the uh, uh, atmospheric oxygen from getting in. And um, 
The last thing here, real quick. The uh, I assume your your palate is pretty diverse at this point. You've you've tasted a whole whole multitude of things. Is there anything that you wouldn't eat again, or, or some sort of ferment that you tasted a couple times and were just like, "Oh my, I, I can't, I can't do this." <laughs> no, no, no. All right. I mean, it's not like I've tasted everything. Yeah. I mean, next next summer, not this coming summer, but next summer, I already have a date to go teach in Iceland. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to trying the notorious hakarai, the uh, the, the 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 buried uh, shark that they make there. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, I'm I guess I'm not expecting to like love that from my first taste, but I mean, I think that. Um, you know, if you're willing to try things a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can really open yourself up to new and unexpected flavors. And I think many of the flavors of fermentation are what we could describe as uh, acquired tastes. And I think it's anybody, uh, you know, any Westerner can relate to this in the realm of cheese. So, you know, there are very mild cheeses that, you know, unless you have a lactose problem, like Mm -hmm. Basically, like everybody who eats cheese likes them um, or likes them enough. And then as you get to the stronger flavored cheeses, you have like a, a narrower range of people who are, are open to like those smells and, and those flavors. And, you know, I've had beautiful pieces of cheese that like I was all excited about and invited friends over to share. And then like, you know, <laughs> one of my guests opened the door and said, did something die in your house? And, you know, they would just never think about putting something that smelled like that into their mouths. But, you know, I wasn't born loving these. It's not like when I was a 10 year old, I loved the stink as cheeses but right. as my life has evolved i've i've just tried to like uh, try things that did not have obvious appeal like if i saw that there was someone who really like valued the flavor of that i'll give it a second chance i think i'm natto this some um, you know somewhat notorious japanese soy ferment is a great example because i the first time i ever tasted natto which was before i even wrote wild fermentation I mean, I just thought it was so horrible. I, I, was like, I never, I never, I never want to taste that. I never want to see that. I didn't write about it. But then, you know, through the years of talking to a lot of people about fermentation, natto kept coming up. And then I met this woman um, uh, who was like, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you some natto, and I'm gonna show you how I hide it in food for my husband, and I'm gonna make you like natto." And she did. And now, I mean, you don't need to hide it in the food. Now I make natto all the time. I like, I love to eat it. And, um, I, I, you know, uh, um, our, our taste is so culturally subjective. Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, we, we like the things that we've been introduced to. And many times the things that we've not been introduced to, because they're part of some completely different cultural tradition that we haven't been part of, um, can, can be um, um, inaccessible. Um, but I like to challenge myself to, to keep, keep trying those things. And I wouldn't say there's any fermented food that I've tried that I just categorically don't want to try again. Yeah. I, I, I feel very, very open to the, um, you know, the more extreme uh, 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 reaches of fermentation a lot of it is also context of how you eat it so like um uh, i recently had a group of like four different chinese descended women in a workshop that i did and we made some we we, we molded some tofu which is a really important thing in, in in chinese culture and then we pickled it a few different ways and one of the women brought some of her uh, uh homemade pickled tofu and um and i like i love it i love the entire spectrum and really i think that the you know the fermented tofu spectrum you know goes from as mild as the mildest cheeses and goes to more extreme than the most extreme cheeses but the extreme ones you don't like pick up a whole block of tofu and eat it like what you do is you you mash it up and mix it with rice and think of it as as like a condiment where a little bit of flavor is going to go a long way so you know so much of how we you know use food is context you know fish sauce like i love yeah. fish sauce but i love like a spoonful in something that it's going to mix in and add a, like a depth of flavor. I'm not like, you know, drinking uh, like a glass of fish sauce because it's so delicious on its own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can, I can attest to that to some degree. I, I, when I first went to Korea for, for, I was there for like a year um, and they had kimchi with everything and it was just so gross and I, I couldn't do it. And then when I left, I was mad because I couldn't find 
good kimchi state style, you know, um, it didn't, didn't exist here. So it's funny how that, that works. But, um, so that's your, some, some of the stuff on, on fermentation. I mean, your, your other books have, I mean, they have so much information in there. Um, but in between you wrote the revolution will not be microwaved. And I, I, I was going through that and it's something that I think, um, it was kind of interesting and people that, uh, listen to the show, I think would probably kind of find interesting. Um, and it's, I know it's a little bit older, but I, I don't think it's, um, much has changed. Uh, I think we still face, uh, some of the, some of the stuff going on, some of the same, same problems. Um, so I guess you're, you've been called a, a food activist. Is that, is that right? Yeah, sure. I saw that on one of these, one of these things. What, what is that? I mean, what, what, what is it that you, that you do with food? What is it that, um, these sort of fermented foods, um, have to offer that, uh, I don't know, supermarket food doesn't, or, or how is it that we're actually, you know, what, what is this, this revolution around, uh, natural food? Well, I mean, um, uh, I'm not sure I would necessarily say that it's around natural food per se. I mean, I think that there, I, I think that there are a lot of different food movements going on, mm-hmm. um, uh, um, you know, kind of simultaneously uh, 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 right now. I mean, for for me, I would say the biggest issue is um, that. Um, you know, human culture, like, like every, every form of life and humanity and t- including humanity until a few um, uh, uh, generations ago, um, y- you know, a, a be- large part of what every kind of organism in the world does is procure its food mm-hmm. through interacting with its environment. And um, humanity has kind of severed itself from uh, uh, from this idea. And over the last couple of centuries, we have fewer and fewer people involved in direct agricultural production. And, um, uh, you know, that's freed up, uh, uh, other people to have lots of time to, you know, play, play video games and look at their (laughs) smartphones and, you know, drop, drive around and do all these other things. And I'm not saying that we need to convert to a world where, you know, everybody is spending all day procuring food for themselves. But I think that something important has been lost. And I would say that, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a a huge like hunger for connection to food. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and I would say that there's a growing critique of you know food that is produced through the system of uh, food mass production that that we have created, and so I'd say there's more and more people who are observing that the methods that allow one person to produce more than enough food for a hundred people are environmentally destructive. Um, I think there are more and more people observing that the overprocessed foods that are um, the cheapest foods in the supermarket are um, nutritionally diminished and leading us into all of these sort of, you know, food related uh, uh, health crises. Um, You know, I would say that there are people who are observing that removing food production from our communities, even if it can be done more efficiently somewhere else, diminishes our productive capacity and has economic costs. And so, um, you know, I think that there, I think that there are just sort of mounting critiques to our system of, of food mass production. Um, and you know, for me, the big issue is people reclaiming food. And so whether that's having a garden, whether that's supporting some local farmers through, uh, uh, shopping at, at, at a farmer's market, uh, whether that's involved in getting involved in, um, uh, uh, fermenting some food. I mean, I think that, I, I think that just like breaking out of this kind of infantilizing role of consumer is a very empowering thing. Uh, for people to realize like, okay, well, I mean, I consume, everybody consumes, but I'm also producing. I'm also making something that I can share with people, that I could trade with people, that I could, I could sell people. Um, and um, so I, I just think that, that that's really important. And, and to me, like the, 
you know, the, 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 the grassroots movements about food that I'm most interested in are the ones that are trying to reclaim food in, in, mm-hmm. in different kinds of ways, whether it's, you know, freeing up land for people to have community gardens and for people who don't own some land to be able to, you know, grow some vegetables for themselves. Um, um, you know, whether we're, 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 we're talking about movements to, um, uh, reallocate wasted food, food recycling kinds of mm-hmm. efforts because we're, we're, you know, our system is a very wasteful uh, 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 system. Um, so I think that there are lots of different food movements, but to me, what they all have in common is this idea of um, uh, reclaiming food. And interestingly, I, I wrote that book, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwave, you know, after wild fermentation came out, and I did this sort of six month long cross country sauerkraut road show. And, you know, really, I was exposed to so many different grassroots food activists. Like, it turns mm-hmm. out a lot of the people who are interested in fermentation are people who are interested in sustainable agriculture or people who are interested in food recycling or, um, you know, people who are interested in different kinds of um, nutrition-driven movements. Um, but, um, you know, I think it really opened my eyes to um, a lot of the different grassroots movements related to reclaiming food in different ways. Um, and that's what, you know, got me excited to write that book, which sadly is out of print. So is if it people really? want to read it, if people want to read it, you're probably going to find a used copy on the internet or find it at a library or something like that. Cause it's, um, it's out of print and there just never was as much interest in, um, in that particular theme as there has been, uh, uh in fermentation. That's too bad. Cause it, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of good stuff in here, a lot of interesting stuff in here, a lot of um, things that you you don't realize. I think you know when you talk about um, you know the 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 higher ups of Monsanto um, getting a job at the FDA and then bouncing back and forth until they're you know passing laws on both sides. You know they're working for the government and they're working for for these giant corporations um, and just that sort of information is all all throughout here and. Um, I do. You know, I think, uh, that reclaiming food, um, like we, I, I got a little setup here, you know, we grow lots of vegetables and stuff, but, um, you know, I can't, I can't do it all, but I have something that I can trade with a neighbor and, and, you know, I can trade some seeds with somebody or I can, you know, trade my vegetables for, for some, some dairy milk or, or some cheese or something or some rabbits, you know, um, and making those, those connections with other people that are, similarly interested in in this sort of movement is just uh it's huge and i'm 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 upset that's out of print that's uh that sucks all right well uh i won't take any more of your time um today i appreciate you coming back on okay well i'm glad i'm glad we um i'm glad we didn't have any technical difficulties this time (laughs) it's been a pleasure speaking with you and uh thank you so much for your interest Right. Is and, it um, anything you want to? Is, is there anything you want to tell people? Tell people to go check out or things you got coming up. You want people to come see or? Oh well, okay, For, yeah, sure. First of all, let me um, let me say that I have a website which is wildfermentation.com dot com, and um, there's information about my books on the website and also the workshops that I teach. And I mean, you mentioned that I do these residency programs uh, uh, where I live in Tennessee twice a year, but. I also I, I also teach all around. Like you know, the, the, you know, this year I'll be um, uh, you know in many places around the U.S. I'll be in Canada. I'll be in Europe. I'll be in Mexico. Um, so um, you know, I get I, I get around and I list all my workshops on my website, so people who are interested can check that out. And then I also just have links to all kinds of fermentation related uh, resources on the World Wide Web. Cool. All right. Uh, I will put okay. all that in the uh, in the show notes. All right, thanks, man. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Ben. Bye bye. Shh! If you listen carefully, you can hear the bacteria just eating the sugar and farting out little bubbles and and turning your vegetables into something delicious and healthy for you. Um, I really, I, I'm almost grateful that the uh, first interview didn't, didn't finish. And I got to talk to Sander again. Um, 
you know, I, I wish I could get up there into uh, to Tennessee and, and do one of his classes, take one of his his classes. Uh, it, it would be a fantastic opportunity. But for now, I, I'm stuck with learning from his books, reading from his books, and uh, of course, there's lots of knowledge in there, lots of good stuff. But uh, hands on is is also also great. And of course, I will link to all of his books in the show notes. They will be Amazon links. So if you click on them, I will get a small commission, supposedly. Uh, I've yet to see it happen, but uh, supposedly it will happen. So uh, that's all for now. Uh, Thank you for for sticking with me. Get out there, sow those seeds of liberty, and all reap cheese of freedom together. I'm going to write us his dream. I'm going to write us his dream. Dream.